Hello, BookTube. Well, it's the very last day of April. And as tempting as it is to just load you with videos about all the April books that I haven't got to yet, this is typically the time when we look ahead. Right? Here on BookTube? This is typically the time when we make uh, provisional TBRs or a pile of obvious possibilities <laughs> uh, for the upcoming month, for May, which starts tomorrow. Uh, I thought I would do that in this video. Of course, this is barely scratching the surface here, but I want to show you a few video, a few books that are coming out in May that I'm either going to read or I've read or I'm going to reread or whatever. Uh, I had a very, it's not over yet, of course. Today is still April. I have had a very, very good reading month for April. 2023, just in general, has been very, very good for uh, the amount of reading, for the engagement with the reading. Still not for, you know, just knock me down amazing masterpieces. Although some of the books that I have read so far in 2023 didn't strike me that way originally and are increasingly striking me that way. It's that fourth dimension, that one extra element of book assessment that we always talk about on this channel. A critic can tell you, you know, all kinds of things that an author does well or poorly. But the one thing a critic can't tell you is what they're going to think about a book in a year. They can't tell you that in their review. Uh, and an accelerated version of that has been happening this year. I don't know if it's just because of the nature of the books involved or because I'm more aware of that, but uh, a few books that, that, I, that I read that initially did not strike me so astoundingly are more and more so. They're going to end up very high in my estimation at the end of the year, I would bet. Uh, so let's look at a, a few of these here, just in case some of them are of interest to you. The first one is by Ruth Shaw, and it's called The Bookseller at the End of the World. And this is uh, something I haven't read. This is another bookstore memoir, in this case of uh, uh, someone who owns a couple of bookstores in remote New Zealand, which I always joke about on this channel that people who want me to mail them books live in rural New Zealand. Uh, but I don't do it anymore. I don't send books to such locations anymore, not only because that that almost always failed uh, and it got to the point where it seemed intentional on the part of the recipient. If if someone would say to me, it's, it's a huge amount to ask, but if you could send that to me, I live in Australia and I live nowhere near any bookstores. That you're the only chance I would have to get it. I'd really appreciate it. And back in the olden days, I used to say, well, okay, give me your address and, and I'll send it. Uh, and I'll just eat the cost, uh, the 75 or $80 cost of sending you one book. Uh, and the person would send back an address. And I would look at it and ponder over it. And then I would write back and say, you know, I'm no expert here. I've never visited Australia. But this address doesn't look complete to me. First of all, you didn't add the word Australia. I'll add that. But it still doesn't look complete to me. Are you absolutely sure that there isn't something important missing here? And they would write back and say, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I forgot this, that, or the other thing. I'd say, oh, okay, well, glad I caught it. Uh, and then I would add that detail, go to the post office, fill out an international mailing form, pay my $80, send off the book. A month later, it still hasn't got there. Two months later, it still hasn't got there. The person responds and says, yeah, I'm, I'm heartbroken. I never actually received the book. And I say, well, this is the address. I, I'm... I'm screenshotting the address that, that was the last thing you sent me with the added detail added in that I thought was missing. That's where I sent it. The person writes back and says, oh, you know, there was, it turns out there was another important detail that I didn't add to the address, even when you asked me for a missing important detail. Oh, that's probably where I went missing. Could you send another book? <laughs> it was, I, I won't say any one particular person, but it was basically one particular exchange like that years ago. I'm sure that it wasn't done out of malice. It was just done out of, out of an absolutely, absolute cluelessness over the fact that just because you're watching me online doesn't mean I'm not a person. I am a person. And you would never be so unthinkingly, babyishly selfish in person with someone. I, I, I had to write back and say, no, I think what I'll do is withdraw $80 in cash from the bank machine and simply leave it on the sidewalk <laughs> because I'm not going to do this again. I do not trust you that you are giving me your full address. Uh, one chance was all you got. And you actually got two because I corrected your address before I tried it. Uh, but it's not only that. It's, it's not only that I, do, that's not the only reason that I don't send things to the other end of the world, literally the other side of the world. It's also that I get the strong impression from New Zealanders and Australians that 
it's an anti-literary culture. There, there's no bookstores, or the bookstores are really bad. The books are unbelievably expensive, not just to mail from somewhere else, but in the country. Uh, I, that that impression could be wrong. I've got that impression so repeatedly, though, that uh, I, I, it, this strikes me as just a dispatch, literally, on, le on several different levels from a different world. Can't wait to see it. Very happy to see this influx of bookstore and bookseller memoirs. I've read a few of them in the last couple of years that have been pretty good. Uh, I think th that's that's a great I, mean, I would like to see an increase in that kind of writing. Uh, then we have something by Jonathan Losos. I think I've seen this on this channel before. This is the Cat's Meow. How Cats Evolved from the Savannah to Your Sofa. And I have read an advanced copy of this. I'll probably reread it. I'll probably read the finished copy. Uh, I I kind of thought from the subtitle and from the cover photo that this would be dumber than it was. It's actually not dumb, and it's an, a big, interesting subject. Uh, I understand an, an author writing a book like this probably doesn't want to get into really deep genetic detail, but it is interesting. Uh, the obvious differences that are right in front of us all the time. Not everybody has any access to horses or cattle or pigs, but cats and dogs are right in front of us all the time. And from those two examples, you can see radically different approaches to selective breeding, to creating an artificial genetic population that humans have done for thousands and thousands of years. The result uh, is pretty telling. It's pretty interesting. And I wonder how much of it is confined to a genetic framework and how much of it is an intentional decision on the part of humans. Dogs can get to 200 pounds. They can get absolutely immense. They can be very tiny, <laughs> very tiny. They can be half Frida size, but they can also be immense, almost, almost pony sized uh, with immense power. There is nothing like that in the thousands of years of selective breeding and genetic engineering that humans have done to cats. There's nothing like that. Cats, some cats in the wild certainly are that big, but domestic cats don't ever get that big. And I wonder, is that because they can't made, be made to get that big? I mean, Maine Coon cats are pretty big, three times Frida's size. But they don't get to German Shepherd size. No, no domestic cat does. Is that because there's a limit to cats, some sort of genetic framework in, in cats' basic makeup? Or is, it, is that a human decision? that you probably don't want a cat that's as big as a German Shepherd because they are, they are in some other ways not domesticated. They know how to kill. They know how to torment their food. Most of them do. Uh, uh, dogs don't know anything like that. They have a few atavistic instincts left about hunting or whatnot, but usually they have to be trained to do that. Uh, whereas plenty of cats do not need to be trained to do that. Maybe you don't want a cat that's the size of a German Shepherd if there's that kind of an X factor involved. Certainly all, all I have to do uh, to send a shiver down my spine on the subject is look at YouTube videos of insane people, completely insane people, who have a pet lion in their home, just, to, just sort of walking around from room to room and hanging out in their home. Inevitably, in those videos, inevitably, there is a video of them inviting a human friend over and the human friend is sitting in the room. The lion walks into the room and the human friend is startled and says, Oh my God. Uh, and the, the weird, insane, always a couple says, Oh, you know, don't mind Simba. Oh, she, she just thinks she's a big dog. She won't bother you at all. And then inevitably, inevitably in one of those videos, the lion attacks the human guest <laughs> and has to be called off or smacked or beaten with sticks or, <laughs> Uh, so maybe there's a reason behind that, but uh, I, even from a first read-through, I can guarantee that if you're a cat person, you're going to want to read this. Now, this one, I have the advanced copy of this. I haven't. I dipped a toe into it uh, just to find out whether or not it was dumb. It's not dumb. It's actually not at all dumb. Now, I, but I really need to just bear down on it, and I was kind of waiting for the finished copy of that. This is by Scott Shapiro, and it is Fancy Bear Goes Fishing. And it's the story of hacking, of online hacking. The, the author uses five key cases of hacking in order to illustrate the whole spectrum of what it's like and why it happens, why it's successful, the routes that it takes, all that kind of stuff, all kinds of stuff like that. I have an enormous fascination 
for the dark side of tech like this. I've read lots of books on this subject, and I'm hoping that this one is one of the best that I've read. Certainly the, the little chunk that I dipped my toe into was wonderful. Uh, but we shall see in May, uh, whether I get a finished copy or not, in May I will definitely read it. Uh, this next one uh, I have read. Oh, was I blocking the bean? I was. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, I've read this one. I intend to reread it when I get the finished copy. This is... We saw it on this channel, and uh, I don't know. Uh, it's uh, This is Fractal Noise by Christopher Pauline, who a lot of you will know as the author of the Aragon books. Uh, this is his second science fiction novel. Uh, it's it's a fraction the size of the first one, Sleep in the Sea of Dreams, set in the same extended universe. Uh, this one taking place on the planet Talok 7, <laughs> which I mentioned when I, when I talked about this with you when we first saw it. I mentioned that that had me smiling throughout the book. And if you are a legion of superhero fans, you will know exactly why. Uh, this is a story of an expedition that finds a deeply unnatural thing on a planet. And what is it? What is that thing? It's basically, in its bare bones DNA, it's a, a classic gimmick of science fiction stories, the finding of a mysterious MacGuffin. I love that kind of gimmick. I love that kind of science fiction. But I'm not really talking about the gimmick here so much as I am the book itself. This was really good. Was, there was a thing about the first book in the series that uh, this is this is actually a prequel to a sea, a Sleep in a Sea of Stars, but this is the thing that I felt about that first book that I questioned myself about. Well, I finished it, the advanced copy that I got, and I thought, oh, that was really good. That wasn't Andy Weir good. That was really good. Was it? Could it be? I keep thinking of this guy as a boy wonder. As a, somebody who was, you know, hawking a self-published book that went on to sell millions of copies when he was a teenager. Uh, I shouldn't. He's an adult. And he's a lot older than some of the science fiction authors who've written masterpieces that I read and reread. I doubted myself. It's a really long book. I know perfectly well. I like really long books. This one is not long, and... I have a deep suspicion for what I can't help but think of as a sophomore book. It isn't, of course. He wrote a whole bunch of books before this, but this is his sophomore science fiction book. I had the same impression here when I finished with this book, that it's it's really genuinely good science fiction. It has a playful element. It has a sort of a fan service element. It's very light on the fan service. You could get a lot worse. John Scalzi, for instance, you could is all fan service, I would say, at this point, but... I, I finished it, and I had that reaction. I thought, I'll wait for the finished copy, but I'm impressed. And I thought maybe there must be something wrong with me. I don't know why. I, I'm thinking of this guy. I thought of him when he was a kid, and he wrote a YA fantasy series. I thought, okay, well, you're locking yourself in here. And now I'm starting to think that that was not true. That would be a cause for rejoicing. But then I read in uh, the latest analog. The, you know, at the back of, the, of Analog, they have a roundup section for book reviews. No one review is very long. There's, they're sort of run together. And the reviewer in that section, I forget right now off the top of my head who it was, when that reviewer got to Fractal Noise, that reviewer had the same impression. You could, you could read it in the words. It was the same thing. It was, okay, this is really good. <laughs> this is really, really good. And the reviewer for Analog is not going to say that if if that isn't there on the page. The reviewer for Analog actually mentioned the word science fiction master. A master of science fiction. A contemporary master of science fiction. That's pretty wild. I'm hoping that something from that review goes onto the finished copy of the book. It's a little bit annoying to me that the, the publishing world tends to ignore the specialty genres that are reviewing these things. I can't remember the last time I saw... Uh, I mean, this is a mainstream publisher. I can't remember the last time I saw a review taken from Analog or Asimov's of such a book. And I, I think it, it's because the, the, the mainstream publishing world just doesn't think to go there for them. When that it carries a lot of weight with the target audience of this book, it'd be great if they quoted that review, that this could be, we could be seeing the birth of a science fiction grandmaster. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm looking forward to rereading it in, in May. Then we have, this is by Timothy Garton Ash. I think we saw this already. This is Homelands. A Personal History of Europe. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very leery of personal histories of X, Y, or Z, but I haven't read this yet, so it could be could be really good. Uh, then we have a bit of travel writing 
I'm uh, abortively, slowly starting anyway to try to do an ongoing travel writing series with Mark at Book Time with Elvis. <laughs> Unfortunately, partnering with me on BookTube uh, kills your BookTube channel, it kills your will to do it. All of a sudden, you disappear. <laughs> this is by Jeff Biggers, and it is called Sardinia. In Sardinia, an unexpected journey in Italy. Uh, with another well-designed American cover, this is this is about Sardinia, where I've spent uh, a good deal of time. It's pretty much split here between cities that are that are going to strike a modern visitor as Paleolithic, and then actual Paleolithic cities. But a travel book on Sardinia, I haven't read such a thing in uh, in a long, long time. So uh, we'll definitely give it a try. Uh, my machine malfunctioned, but we're gonna. We're going to take it in our strides. We have a lot more books to go through. Uh, okay, this next one is one that I uh, read. I read it in the advanced copy. I read it in the finished copy, and I loved it. It is a great reading experience. I wholeheartedly recommended it. I read. I reviewed it for my newspaper in in Georgia. This is Jonathan Ag's biography of Martin Luther King. A uh, big, fat, one-volume biography of King that. Uh, I had to put it on this list because I will probably read it again before the end of the year. Maybe even. I mean, I got the finished copy, the big phone book size finished copy, and I didn't actually sit down and read that thing from beginning to end. I, instead, I dipped in here and there, and I also looked a lot at the supporting material in the back. But I probably should read the whole thing again just because it was that good. Uh, I hesitate only because I'm such a dyed-in-the-wool critic. And, okay, fine, I, I read the advanced copy because I want... Uh, the first flavor and the first impressions. And then I, rumin I ruminate on those, and then I get the finished copy, and I read that again with pencil in hand to take notes. And then I write up a review, and then the review runs and appears and will will maybe be excerpted on the paperback. And then I, I kind of feel like the, the, the tension snaps. I kind of feel like my duty by that book is done. But, I, you know, I'm first and foremost a reader. So a reread of this even now would not be amiss. Uh, then we have Alison Weir. Alison Weir is one of uh, the ranks of historians who also write historical fiction. Uh, Carly Erickson is an, another example of that. Most recently, those ranks were joined by Dan Jones with his novel Essex Dogs. And I, Alison Weir, Carly Erickson, even Dan Jones, I pretty much will follow these people, whether they're writing fiction or nonfiction. I'm certainly not going to say no, in my mind, Alison Weir is a historian, so I'm only going to read her history. I'm not going to read her fiction. Certainly, I'm not going to do that. And her new book is not history. It's a novel. It's called The King's Pleasure, and it's uh, billed as a novel of Henry VIII. I'm assuming that's supposed to be Henry on the cover. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, this is interesting because most historical novelists just don't do this. They write around Henry. We get uh, you know a series of novels from the point of view of uh, the Seymour family or the wives. Oh my God, you've had a dime for every book about the wives or you know, most famously recently Cromwell, uh, but not Henry himself, not squarely Henry himself. And the ones that have been squarely about Henry himself have been oh my, almost painful to read. It turns out that for being one of the most famous people in history, he's one of the most elusive. I've made mention on this channel a few times a comment that tends to scandalize some of you Tudor history fans, which is that I don't think Henry has even had a truly great biography. Not the whole Henry. I've read I've Jasper Ridley's book, uh, Scarisbrick's book. They, they do good things with large chunks of Henry, but not the whole man. You never finish a biography. I've never finished a biography of Henry VIII and felt like there was a portrait of a man in the way that I felt about that Martin Luther King biography, for instance. I'm not expecting a novel to do anything like that, but it'd be nice if this novel didn't have him as a gibbering psychopath. That would be that would be really nice. We, we will see. I'm going to go in. I mean, Alison Weir's credit in The Bank of Steve is really good. Uh, so I will I will go into it warily, but acceptingly. I'm hoping that, it, that it's everything I want it to be. Then we have a Norton Centenary edition. Uh, of Letters to a Young Poet by Rilke. This is this is translated by M.D. Herder Norton. No idea if M.D. Herder Norton is a relation to the Norton family. I can't help but think not. I'm pretty sure they died out a long time ago. But I will always... I, I read this translation, I believe, last year. But now it's in some sort of new edition. I haven't seen what this looks like physically yet. 
Uh, but it'll probably be the, the edition of this book that I want. And this book is always worth rereading. So, uh, and then we have historical fiction again. This is Deborah Magpie Erling. This is uh, the Lost Journals of Sacagawea. I think we've already seen this uh, on this channel. Another great cover design, American cover design. Just cannot gainsay it. The 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 fact that the bear is in the background, totally covered by the letters, is actually very wise. It's actually a very good visual choice. Uh, there's uh, a gigantic history here and a gigantic history with me on the subject. I am a big, big fan of the primary source for this character, the journals of Lewis and Clark. And uh, I'm also a big, big fan. There was a thousand page novel called Sacagawea a long time ago. It looked like supermarket checkout fodder. I imagine most people wrote it off that way. I thought it was really, really good. Uh, so it's going to be hard not to think about that and things like it when I'm reading this, but I'm hoping that the book makes me, think about other things and that's clearly what it's meant to do it's clearly meant to recast the character i want that very much give me a sacagawea that i've never even imagined before loved it love to see it uh then we have martin rady i think we've seen this on this channel this is the middle kingdoms a uh, big fat history of central europe the various kingdoms that have risen and fallen in central europe can you hear that she's snoring she never does that. Maybe you can't hear that. <laughs> Got it in my ear. <laughs> uh, uh, well, that is just adorable. <laughs> so narrowly, you're the ones who pay attention to freedom, but that is just adorable. It's rainy here, so she she doesn't want to be awake at all. Uh, but this, it, I'd be interested to see what this does. I'm imagining that there'll be a lot of history here that I don't know, and that's always welcome to me. Uh, then we have Never Again, uh, this is the Germans after the Holocaust. I think we've seen this on this channel. Very much looking forward to this for uh, May. Very much looking forward. This is a well-trod subject about how the, the Germans reacted to World War II and the Holocaust. How they shaped their own identity. How they taught it in school. How they wrote about it and thought about it. It's a big subject, and if I recall correctly, this is not a big book, but could be really really good anyway definitely on on my radar although i'm gonna have to write about it on my own I, it's really hard to find a mainstream venue i'm hoping that some mainstream really big mainstream venues will write about it uh, then we have uh we have uh jeff shara uh, whose new book he writes historical fiction and his new book is the old lion and despite the title, I think this is a novel about the entire life of Theodore Roosevelt, not just when he was out of office in the interval between when he left the White House and when he died. I think it's about all of him, the, the, his whole life, even from when he was a young lion. Uh, I, I'm always a little bit weird. It's, it's weird to me that there are such large chunks of American history that don't ever seem to get mainstream historical fiction treatment. And believe it or not, Roosevelt is one of them. The whole progressive era is one of those. I, I, I never really understand that. I don't know why this isn't the 1,000th historical novel that I have read about Theodore Roosevelt. But I, I welcome it. The This is a, a life that I know really well. This is a subject that I know really well. And this is an author that I know really well. I've read everything this author has written, and I've also reviewed him for the Christian Science Monitor and the Washington Post. Uh, if you hear a little bit of hesitation in my voice, it's because something happens with this author that I cannot absolve him of complicity in. And that is the, the conflation of his work and his father's work on the American Civil War. That I've seen booktubers look at Jeff Shar and, and Michael Shar and say, well, the one wrote The Killer Angels about the Battle of Gettysburg, and then the other wrote the two prequels to that book and the two sequels to that book. And that is absolutely not true. That is only a publisher's marketing gimmick. There is no connection between the two other than that the one is blood related to the other. Michael Shire did not authorize sequels or prequels to his work. The Killer Angels is a great book. One of the great books in the American 20th century. Nothing that Jeff Shire has written comes close to it in literary quality. And it, it seems to me, I don't know how much of a hand he had in that, if any, but that kind of marketing always seems to me to be really bad. 
much like what we see with Dune, for instance, where a total newcomer to Frank Herbert's Dune novels will look at their display in a bookstore or go to a website, and they'll be told that there are 15 books by Brian Herbert and Kevin Anderson that they have to read first before they get to Dune, as if it's one tapestry. It's not one tapestry at all. Not at all. That is a marketing gimmick. That is not the truth. So, <laughs> in a way, I'm kind of glad that this has nothing at all to do with the Civil War. This that will make it easier. Uh, this author, I've also found that this author's World War II stuff and his World War One stuff is also more palatable to me because I ju I'm just not when I'm reading those things. I'm just not thinking about a, a marketing push to subsume the independent identity of a great earlier work by an author's relative. I don't like that push at all. I don't think that should be happening. Uh, and then we have uh, D.J. Taylor, who is, again, someone that I've reviewed, I think, in the Washington Post. Uh, he wrote a book called Darby Day that was a, a very Trollopian novel. And uh, here he's doing nonfiction. Here he's doing a big fat, I think this is like 700 pages, a new biography of Orwell. He's had a million biographies. I've read more biographies of this guy, I swear. <laughs> I swear. It, again, I, I mean, I have a rant that I could go on here that Orwell was a fascinating figure. And he, in 1984, he wrote a book, An Animal Farm. He wrote a book, books that everybody is, re, has read in school. But he had lots of contemporaries who haven't had even two biographies in the last hundred years. He's had a hundred. Um, nevertheless, <laughs> this is a big biography of a well-known figure. I, and I'm, I'm well primed to read it. I've read earlier biographies of this figure, and I've read a lot written by this figure. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Haven't got it yet. Uh, then we have a big National Geographic production. I've shown you a lot of those on this channel. They are oversized. They have gorgeous, high-definition photography. Is usually the whole point. Uh, and this one, this one is of very great interest to me. This is by Carlton Ward, with a forward by Carl Hyacin, which will give you a hint as to what state it takes place in. And this is called The Path of the Panther. Look at that cover. That's not a statue. That's not taxidermy. That's one of those motion capture cameras that you hide on a tree on a game trail. Or you hide many of them. And they capture these animals when there are no humans around. Uh, and this is all about the Florida panther. There's, there's a, a giant cat that lives in Florida. And in the mid-20th century, it was on the doorstep of extinction. Fewer than a dozen living beings left, I think. I think it got down that low. Although it's hard to tell with a, a, an elusive cat, a secretive cat like like a mountain lion. Uh, the Florida panther is an amazing animal. I have never actually seen one in the wild, although I was trekking in the Florida wilderness once when my dogs w were... My boys were hullabalooing and assuring me that they were not hullabalooing over an alligator or a deer or a, a raccoon. They they weren't they couldn't specify because they didn't have English vocabulary, but they were definitely telling me that they were hullabalooing over something extremely unusual and worthy of hullabalooing. <laughs> not that it, if you have a large crowd of beagles, they'll hullabaloo over a dust bunny. <laughs> but uh, I I'm pretty sure that they came across fresh spore of a, a mountain lion. I keep calling it a mountain lion. Of course, in Florida, they don't live in mountains. They don't, they're not, I, I'm going to learn a lot about the Florida panther in this book, and I'm going to see some incredible photography. Just incredible. I'm all up for it. <laughs> Absolutely up for it. Uh, then we have a Penguin Classic. Uh, this is uh, Brave Men. Ernie Pyle was a World War II war correspondent. Once upon a time, incredibly famous, incredibly popular and well-known. Uh, and finally is entering into the Penguin Classic Pantheon. Can't wait. Uh, can't wait. It, see what they do with this, what, what the introduction, what points the introduction makes, what kind of critical apparatus, if any, there is. Can't wait. Should be getting this soon. Uh, I haven't read Brave Men in, oh God, I haven't read Ernie Pyle at all, any Ernie Pyle in so long. Uh, then we have some, this is by John Tennell. This is another tech book, History of Tech. We saw that with the Apple II. And this is called The Philosopher of Palo Alto. Uh, Mark Weiser, Xerox Park, and the Original Internet of Things. <laughs> the digitally designed cover. Another really good cover design for an American book. That we've seen almost no examples to the contrary. Think of that cover for Fractal Noise by Christopher Pauline. 
uh, and this is about a, a guy who's died 30 years ago, but had a, apparently a groundbreaking vision of what computers could be and very much did not like the idea of computers being always interconnected and always on. Very much did not like the idea of computers harvesting data from us instead of us using computers. It'd be interesting to see what this author has done. Is, he, is this author going to lean mostly into this, this man's personal life? Or are we going to get... I mean, the philosopher Palo Alto leads me to think this is going to be at least half ideological. But I'm going to learn about what this guy wrote and said. I'm up for it either way. Uh, the Internet of Things is a deep in, subject of interest to me. Um, as long as we're on the subject of philosophy, we'll go with Robin Waterfield. Robin Waterfield is a terrific translator, great classicist. And Robin Waterfield's new book is Plato of Athens, A Life in Philosophy. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that means that this is a critical reading of the writings of Plato or if this is an attempt to write a biography of Plato, or maybe both. I think the latter is, is largely impossible, but I could be wrong. <laughs> I could very well be wrong. I'm far more familiar with Latin sources than Greek sources. So naturally, I'm going to read this, whether I, you don't, you don't have to be a big fan of Plato's writings to read this and find it interesting. Uh, then we have, uh, this is Peter uh, Wollabin, uh, uh, who wrote The Hidden Life of Trees, which I, I read and really liked. And this is his new book, The Power of Trees. Uh, and this is more of the same. This is him exploring what trees are like, how they've evolved, how they communicate with each other, how they grow, how they manage, manage their environment even though they've made the evolutionarily uh, serious choice to be stationary, to be rooted to the ground and armor themselves. The, your tree is covered in heavy, thick bark, most of them are, specifically because they can't run from predators, because they can't run from natural disasters. They're rooted to the ground, so they cover themselves in armor, and their mouths, essentially their nutrient intake, is way up there and facing the things they feed on. Uh, I read uh, The Hidden Life of Trees, and then, I, and I will read this one. I haven't got a copy of this yet. I will read this one, but in between, I read Plant of Sapiens, the book that is just will not leave my mind, where the author stresses over and over again that these this is not blind instinct, that trees are thinking, that they're, they have self-awareness, they have uh, altruism and caring for each other and preferences about the world. I don't know how much of Plantus Sapiens was true, but I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. Uh, and uh, naturally, to be on my mind when I read this thing. Uh, then we have, this is Jamie Loftus. This is a book called Raw Dog. And it is a, the author traveling around the country of America in search of the history and the natural history, the field representation of hot dogs. Those of you who have never been to America, maybe don't know American culture all that well, maybe you've never experienced a hot dog. Uh, or you may be thinking that they, they bear a surface resemblance to Wiener Schnitzel or some, some of the civilized versions that you might get on the continent of Europe. Uh, the true hot dog experience is nothing like that at all. <laughs> it's... it's really has to be experienced to be understood. No one knows what's in hot dogs. No one knows what they're made of. No one knows where their vendors come from at sporting events. They clearly resemble human beings, the vendors do, but they clearly aren't human. <laughs> so I, I, it's, a, it's a deep, mysterious subject, and I can't wait to see what this author does with it. And another great American cover design, the words raw dog are done in, in uh, condiments. <laughs> it's sprayed on in condiments. <laughs> That's really good. Uh, this will probably be a thin thing. This is The Lockup by John Banville, who has taken to splitting his literary time between uh, police procedural whodunits and uh, more quote-unquote serious novels that he also does. Uh, this is obviously one of the former. And I've read a couple of those. I've reviewed a couple of those. They don't always strike me as successful. Uh, when you get to a situation like this where a so-called serious author, Banville is a serious author, uh, when you get a situation like this where a serious author is also periodically writing what Graham Greene used to refer to as entertainments, your initial suspicion is something that the author has to work to dispel. It's not your job 
you're perfectly within your bounds to think that any serious author who writes a book like this is doing a left-handed exercise, that this is something dashed off. That there's, no, there's no care or thought or heart in a book like this. You're perfectly justified to think that, to suspect it. And it's John, it's John Banville's job, or whoever, whatever the author is, it's their job to dispel that, because they already know that characterization is in place. Uh, and it, I guess what I'm saying about Mel, Banville's police stuff is that they've never dispelled that for me. They always do end up ultimately feeling like left-handed exercises. We'll see. We'll see. I would never miss anything by this author, so we'll see if this one does. Uh, then something, I think I've mentioned this before on this channel. This is by Greg Jarrett with Don Yeager's help, and this is The Trial of the Century, a new book about the Scopes Monkey Trial from 100 years ago, where a young teacher in the American South taught evolution to his class of boys and that was against the law and he went to trial and as you can see on the cover there the two advocates were two of the most famous men in america you won't recognize either one of them now one is william jennings bryan the other is clarence darrow one of the greatest lawyers since cicero uh, they took on the the case for and against uh and it made national headlines because as you can tell from the the uh the the slang name that attached to it was the monkey trial. Uh, it the, it, became, it quickly be, expanded from being a trial about whether or not that one teacher broke the law uh, to putting evolution on trial. Putting the subject, the, the whole concept of evolution by means of natural selection on trial. And unfortunately, that is a relevant subject. I've just, just recently, just this week, I had an email exchange with the author of a book who does not believe in science at all, thinks the earth and the universe and everything was created by magic 6,000 years ago. And it just calmly responded to email saying, now nah, there's plenty of evidence. Oh, I'm just going by the evidence. I'm not, this is not a, a, a discussion of faith. I'm going by the evidence. And reciting religious propaganda talking points made by propaganda mills like Answers in Genesis as if he was pulling them from science textbooks. And wanting to teach this to kids. Things that are manifestly false. No matter what you believe in your soul about the rightness of Christian of the Christian faith. It is not a question of your faith. It is not a we'll agree to disagree about whether or not Noah's flood really happened. It didn't. It didn't. <laughs> there are 80 million different ways that we can know. As sure as we know anything. That, the, that was not a Noachian flood. Obviously, even if we didn't have all the scientific ways that we have to know that, we would still know it because obviously all life on Earth did not descend from two individuals of their, of their kind. All humans on Earth did not, did not descend from eight people on a boat. It's so obviously a piece of mythology. And yet, that author that I had exchanges with, he lives in the light of the, 20th, of the 21st century, he uses a cell phone. If he has a stabbing pain in his head, I guarantee you he'll use an EKG at the hospital. None of that is possible, unless evolution is true, but he will, I will use those things unquestionably. Just calmly said, no, I'm just, I, I just go where the evidence is. That's all. <laughs> I, I, I tried to point out you know, there, there was a, a land straddling technology using empire in China, in Egypt, in Korea, long before when you're saying the whole universe started and just bounced right off. So obviously this is still a vital subject. Obviously you could have a trial like this today. If the, the Republicans in the United States Congress today had free power, they would put this on trial and make it illegal. Uh, so we'll see what Greg Jarrett has to say about it. Uh, I, I've read a lot of books on the subject. We shall see. Then we have uh, Wash Ashore by my Vineyard Gazette editor, Bill Evel. This is his book about living and working on Martha's Vineyard, uh, raising kids, having a wife who's a, who is a minister at an old, old church. Uh, I meant to dive into this just the other night, and I, when, as soon as I got it, I did not. I was sidetracked by another book on this list, but I'm going to. I'm sure that I'm going to enjoy it. Uh, then we have something by Dr. Quain or Kwane Stewart. This is What It Takes to Save a Life, an upcoming book about street veterinarian help, about finding animals, the, the worst off, the hardest off animals, and giving them a chance, giving them veterinary help. I love books like this. They break my heart, but I love books like this 
it'll all depend on execution, of course. It'll all depend on the author's ability, but I'm looking forward to it. Then we have something I don't have to doubt. For this next one, I don't have to doubt the author's ability. This author's ability is extremely well known to me. <laughs> this is The author is Norman Lebrecht, and this is Why Beethoven. Uh, sort of a companion book to his uh, Why Mahler. <laughs> Needless to say, his book Why Mahler did not convince me at all. <laughs> I, at the, even at the end of that book, after a careful reading, I still wanted to put a comma between the two words. Why, Mahler? <laughs> Why? With Beethoven, I won't have that problem. I already can answer this question. But, but this will be the same thing where Norman Lebrecht looks at Beethoven through a whole bunch of different works. And he is a wonderful writer on classical music, just amazingly good. So don't miss him. If you like books about classical music, don't miss him. Uh, then we have Martha Wells, the author of the Murderbot Diaries. This is uh, a big fantasy book, Witch King, very nice American cover there. I uh, don't know much about this, but uh, always willing to give this a try when the author's credit in the Bank of Steve is so high and her credit could not be higher. Uh, and then finally we'll end with... with uh, the book that bumped my editor bill level and also a perfect example of the kind of book I'm talking about that is steadily going up in my estimation, the more I read it and reread it and rummage around in it. And that is this, this is the world by Simon Sebag Montefiore, which I mentioned the other day as being a kind of cladistic history of the world. But the more I read this, the more I really hunker down with uh, the footnotes and the end notes and the, individual chapters taken apart from others, the more I realize that this is a, just a world history, but there's no just about it. It's amazing. Just amazing. It's 1,400 pages long, so it's no, it's no small endeavor. But this is coming out in May, and I have been living inside this book, in and on, in, on and off, in between other books, I have been living inside this book. I read it originally from, you know, cover to cover, and then I got the finished copy, the big finished copy, and I've been living inside that thing. Just This is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. This is impressing me more the more I read it, the more I think about it. I'm thinking that for May, this comes out, I think, on the 4th. Or no, uh, I think this is the 16th. The 16th of May is a, is a big date. That's when a huge number of things that month are coming out. I think that what I, what I probably will do is just take a pencil and instead of picking around and looking at the end notes and chasing down sources, I think I'll just read this from beginning to end again and just make it the only book, you know, for a weekend or a couple of days or something like that. I think I'll just do that uh, and maybe hope that that scoops up as many reactions as I possibly can have. This is, I don't know, it's, it's going to be a tough sell. It's a hard thing to recommend it, it, because it's huge. Uh, the hardcover is probably murderously expensive, but it, that's not the, the main reason why I'd hesitate, because you could get it from your library. The main reason I'd hesitate in recommending it to you is that it's gigantic. It would, re it would re For most of you who have jobs and kids and school and whatnot, it would represent a huge amount of the reading that you do for any given month, much less any given weekend. But I still do want to recommend it. I don't... I don't know. I, I do recommend it, definitely. If you are if you like big, fat histories of the world, there have been quite a few, and quite a few of them have been really good. This is like not quite like any that I've ever read, and it's I, I love it. I absolutely love it. So we'll end on a really high note. Uh, and we're gone. Look at how long this video is. I'm sorry. Very sorry about that. You can be talking about books, especially forthcoming books. And this is this tends to happen. Sorry. I'll wrap this up for now. Though That's a, a provisional May TBR or pile of obvious possibilities, whatever that acronym is. <laughs> and I could, like like I mentioned with April books, I could do many of these. We could just go over all the books that are coming out in May and what we think of them and what they look like, where they fit in their context. I'll probably do another May TBR this week. Uh, but that, that's this is long enough for now. <laughs> so I'll wrap this up. I will see you soon. Thank you, book two.